And then we come to our um, general discussion with some help from Isabel, George, Jose, and Rajan. Please unmute yourself. You, whoever feels free to go first, please just start. I defer to Isabel. I should start? Okay. Hi. You're my listed name. here first. I'm listed first. Okay. Yeah, I don't really know what to say, but I read in the email that we should somehow conclude what we learned today and what was our favorite. So my name is Isabel. I have a PhD in genetics of aging and I'm the scientific spokesperson of the Forever Healthy Foundation. Um, and I really enjoyed today's meeting. I think also the structure was really cool how we really went from the clinical testing to defining biomarkers to also um, now defining what, what we need to have it more accepted in the public and also um, more the ethics behind it. Um, I think what we learned is that there will never be this one biomarker we heard about. We can have transcriptomics, epigenetics, or proteins, even proteomics. They need to be sensitive, sensitive and robust. and um, and they need to have clinical relevance. And um, I think what we learned today, what I also learned today is that AI is this. Um, so for myself, I have to say I learned a lot. Um, omics is something that is coming. And I think in combination with AI, um, um, yeah, this will be um, really helpful in developing new biomarkers, but also we already have a lot like the frailty index. I think it's always a combination um, and um, yeah, it's definitely crucial for the aging field. I used to work with C. elegans. They just died after 30 days. So it was quite easy for humans. We need to have biomarkers. Um, but I was um, really positive today because I feel the field is really moving forward. Um, and with that, I would like to give to George. Okay, thank you, Isabel. Very positive remarks, <laughs> George. Okay, so um, I study more disease of degeneration than basic aging itself, and I learned a lot from this meeting. Uh, one of the things is just highlighting that in most of the developed world, um, what people are dying of is degenerative diseases of aging. In fact, uh, the estimates that 90% of the people dying in the United States are dying of degenerative diseases. Uh, it's not a surprise to me, and even infectious diseases impinge on it. But modern medicine has very little um, effectiveness in any of these diseases. We're only hitting them at the periphery and barely there. And I think this is because <clears throat> There's a lack of concepts. Medicine has been so long in dealing uh, with diseases that uh, are from the outside, or predominantly infectious disease, or diseases of obvious defect. We don't know how to deal with diseases that are part of our normal biology, and aging is part of our normal biology. And I think the type of approach used here, which is you need new concepts, but it's hard to get to new concepts when you don't even have an idea of what what concept to fill it with, and you need data. And the biomarker approach is definitely one of those ways to get at that, uh, especially when it's used in an uncritical, uh, excuse me, a critical unbiased manner, either using AI, biomarker, all of those can yield substantiation for things that have been studied before, but never were studied so eloquently. I was very impressed with the work of showing glycoaging because I know I, years ago, we found major glyco, um, glyco changes during Alzheimer's disease, which play a role in polymer formation of tangles and plaques. I was also impressed of the therapeutics um, that were presented, the alpha-ketoglutarate deodorate. Alpha-ketoglutarate is a therapeutic because in several neurodegenerative diseases, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is one of the enzymes that's known to be altered during the disease very early, quite substantially reduced. Uh, there's an active site on that enzyme, which is very susceptible to oxidase stress. And um, I was also impressed by the um, frank discussion about the need to balance less bureaucracy. 
if you just end up with more scientists and more money, and I see that in my field in Alzheimer's disease, if you don't have new concepts in an open field, you end up actually entrenching things uh, so that it costs more money to develop drugs or actually impede progress rather than open it up. So I, I think scientists need to be, that have an open mind need to be involved in what processes need to go forward, um, balancing the ethics there. And then I know the discussion about lower insurance premiums for those that are lower risk. I would worry about the other contrary thing uh, with genomics and even further refinement, will people find that they are uninsured and should be dead? <laughs> In other words, they have bad genes, bad health, et cetera, and we abandon them. So I think that the ethics part needs to be really discussed and how governments and processes can balance those things. And the last thing, which I didn't to discuss, and I may have missed it, is when it's discussed that aging is a, you know, this process that we're trying to modify, the fact that it occurs in essentially every organism, um, is this an evolutionary thing of a need to turn over us? Are we not, is it an organismal apoptosis and the process? It doesn't mean you can't modify it, but is it a process that if you interrupt it, you would not have uh, you would have less fitness to the environment because you change the turnover. And um, those are some of the comments I have. Thanks a lot, George. Jose? Okay. Um, Jose. Well, greetings to everybody from Madrid, from Spain, in the middle of this crisis. And this is my weapon against COVID. We have to be prepared with our weapons. But uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Didier and Sven for keeping this alive. Uh, the Hills Conference, the symposium, very important. I have participated in the three previous ones and I enjoy them. And I think this is the biggest, at least in terms of virtual participation. So congratulations. And I also want to congratulate Ilya Stambler because he is the one who pushed for the creation of a uh, the longevity day and then the longevity month. So this is very important and I think that people need to be recognized. So congratulations and DDA and Sven for all your efforts. Basically, I have four comments, uh, four different areas that I want to, to talk about quickly in order to push our goals for anti-aging and rejuvenation and with metrics because we need to measure things. I am an engineer from MIT and I love to measure everything. So we need to measure and uh, in terms of social issues, I think uh, David Wood, who is by the way, my proud co-author in our book, The Death of Death, uh, he, he gave some insightful ideas and how to get the public excited about this and how we can get more and more information socially and acceptable. So I think this is very important. So that is the social issue. Now let me talk about the political issue because Didier has also been involved politically in Belgium. And I have been also, I run for the European Parliament. Actually, many of us here have been running for the European Parliament. Attila Sordas in England, he got 3,000 votes for the European Parliament. I got 7,000 votes in Spain from Madrid, 7,000 votes, which is pretty good in a quick campaign of three months for the European Parliament. And then Felix Bert, he got 71,000 votes in Germany. And this is remarkable. Obviously, Germany is much bigger, and they have existed for five years, the, the German Party for Health Research. But taking these ideas into politics is fundamental. And my master idea for Spain was the creation of the European Agency for Anti-Aging. European Agency for Anti-Aging. And we obviously, we wanted to copy in a way the US National Institute on Aging, but in put a lot of data, a lot of information. So all these biomarkers and all these uh, uh, epigenetic clocks would be fundamental for that. So after talking about politics and social, let me talk about technology because we live in the most amazing time in human history and technology is changing exponentially. I like to say that in the next 20 years, we are going to see more changes than in the last 2000 years. 
this is exponential change and the idea of the singularity with my friend Ray Kurzweil, uh, where we work at Singularity University 10 years ago. Anyway, so in terms of our field, absolutely remarkable. First, uh, Xenolytics, CRISPR, the TAME uh, trials, all the biomarking, epigenetic clocks, uh, the Yamanaka factors, telomerase uh, treatments, it's, it's incredible. Nothing of this existed 10 years ago. So this is moving very fast. Technology keeps on advancing. And so I am very excited that um, uh, we are uh, going in the right trend. I would like it to be even faster, but I am not terribly disappointed because I think we are getting to a tipping point, a tipping point. Also, we can see that in conferences. Oh, today, I have been in three longevity conference, three. In the morning, the longevity investors conference from Zurich. Uh, at midday, the Ibero-American conference, longevity conference in, in Spanish and Portuguese, Latin America and Spain. And finally, this other conference. So three conferences in a day is, is absolutely remarkable. And this year there have been about, I don't know, but at least between 10, 15 longevity conferences. So this is becoming very popular. And so I get to the final point about this popularity, which is economics. And this is important, economics. And then obviously uh, the uh, longevity dividend initiative also didn't really exist uh, 10 years ago. And now thanks to Keith and uh, Liv, I think now there will be a relaunch with the longevity dividend version 2.0. And this is very important because people need to understand that this is actually economically intelligent. This is positive economically. This will create more revenue and less expenses if people are healthy, if people are youthful. So I think uh, just to recap, we are going in the right uh, trend, uh, socially, politically, technologically, and even economically. So I want to be positive and I am pretty sure in the next uh, uh, European uh, health symposium, uh, we are going to have better ideas and better results. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Energetic as always. So please now the final comments or even slides from Ranjan. Yes, hello. Good afternoon uh, and night, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me here. Um, very pleased. Uh, I'm probably new to every single person here, and I'm, I'm uh, very thrilled to be part of this uh, community today. Uh, thank you to the organizers as well. Um, it's amazing to see that so many people are touching on many of the same numerous themes today. Uh, it really shows uh, sort of a critical mass of building here towards uh, a highly coordinated effort. Uh, just a quick introduction, since I'm relatively unknown to everybody. Uh, I initially was involved uh, with a nonprofit and with the uh, Personal Genome Project at Harvard Medical School. That's where I cut my teeth, uh, mostly in community building, in open source uh, science, uh, participant-focused uh, science. Uh, in the world of genomics. Uh, an unrelated project, which I'm currently involved with right now, is called RADVAC, a Rapid Deployment Vaccine Collaborative. Uh, that project was motivated by the obvious harm occurring uh, right now in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and it, in the recognition that current structures in place for vaccine development and pandemic response have significant shortcomings, uh, as all highly well-defined systems do. And it's uh, based primarily on self-experimentation. So this uh, open source uh, IP free uh, platform was primarily developed by Preston Estep, um, a, sign, a genomicist uh, from Harvard uh, who released this formula um, for a vaccine platform to accelerate uh, vaccine development around the world. Uh, and it is entirely self-experimentation based. So a number sorry, of us- to, to interrupt. Are you actually showing yeah. slides? Because we can't- I am, I am not, I apologize, I should have oh, clarified. Just, perfect, then that's great. Just to, to make sure, sorry for, sorry for interrupting, yeah. Okay, uh, and I apologize. In fact, my name, uh, I am 
I am logged in twice, so I see that my my image is not uh, is not coming up. Uh, why don't I just uh, I'll just go ahead and switch my audio here. Just continue. We we highlighted your video. We spotlighted your video. <laughs> All right. Uh, so so this this project was um, is based on self experimentation. So a number of us have actually experimented on ourselves uh, with this new vaccine formulation and are currently test you know testing samples uh, and validating data and developing new testing methods. So one of the things that um, Didier asked me to address was this theme of self-experimentation, of uh, open source science, um, of individual level science, citizen science, in the context of what is being discussed today. And um, this, of course, varies by jurisdiction, but uh, these sorts of things obviously depend highly on a well-informed public um, and citizen scientists who may not be professional scientists, although in some, some cases they are professional scientists, working outside the boundaries of institutions, uh, but citizen scientists who are uh, interested and willing and educated uh, enough to um, carry out some of this experimentation on themselves. And that of course relates to what was discussed here. Um, uh, Josh Middeldorf's talk in particular on uh, the observational trial uh, points to the, the fact that a large number of people are using interventions on themselves. Uh, and so there is significant value in following them and that data and collecting data, maintaining connections with them. Um, it's also about accessibility uh, in, in light of the vaccine effort. Uh, we know that with the vaccine situation, uh, higher income countries are going to have access almost immediately to the vaccines when they're improved. Uh, they've been pre-manufactured, of course, in some cases. Uh, whereas lower income countries will have to wait six months or a year or longer. Uh, and so this was motivated also by um, creating an independent effort that was outside the bounds of the conventional way of doing things to bypass this delay in saving lives or, or uh, preventing morbidities in light of the vaccine crisis, which I would say also applies quite a bit um, to longevity technologies. Um, the landscape is completely changing, of course. Um, the, you know, there's a new world, one in which technologies are more accessible, both through the lower cost, um, as well as miniaturized equipment, accessible supply chains, and cost, you know, customizable manufacturing capabilities, um, desktop you know, manufacturing, things like that, uh, and the wide availability of information. So the average person, average citizen scientist can access, you know, almost many, many things and, and more and more as paywalls come down and educate themselves and take matters into their own hands. So that's, that's a very real landscape that we're gonna be dealing with and tying this into the legal you know, framework uh, and regu regulatory framework, those things are gonna have to keep up because this new reality is a reality. Um, so uh, just a few words on citizen science. Um, much of what was uh, so much of what was said, uh, citizen science is an incredibly powerful untapped resource. Um, crowdsourcing was a word that was used today, which is very much related. Um, by inviting participants in observational trials or in distributed research efforts uh, to be co-investigators um, and bringing them into the co the conduct of certain studies, uh, we can leverage this to enable easier iteration on research. So by maintaining, for example, contact with study participants who may not be in a traditional clinical trial network uh, or structure, um, it, it, it's sort of a hybrid uh, situation where uh, people are feeding into, you know, their, with their data um, into a distributed research effort and can be recontacted for additional testing and questionnaires. Um, Oftentimes, the newer research sheds light on what older research has shown. And wouldn't it be nice not to have to execute an entirely new clinical trial to test a revised hypothesis, but simply to get in touch with participants of a past study and collect you know, uh, incremental more, incrementally more information or additional samples to update the hypothesis instead of 
outlaying tremendous amounts of time and money for a completely new investigation. So uh, there's too much to discuss here in such a short time, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Ranjana. Um, so this uh, being German, so I'm very happy that we saved all the time again and now it's quarter past 10. So uh, we take a very short break of 10 minutes to finalize the text or the declaration. Um, yeah, Jose kind of took, a word, took already the words I wanted to say, but I'm just uh, going to say the names again. Really, Sven, Didier, Ilya, also Virginie, awesome what you did. I really enjoyed it. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm really looking very much forward to seeing you or meeting you all in person again, hopefully next year in Brussels. So bear with us, 10 minute break, and then we are there for the very, very final session.